With that in mind, our scripture lesson for this morning is what's in the bulletin, so at least that much is predictable. We're reading the Gospel of John, chapter 2, verses 13 through 22. The Passover of the Jews was near, and so Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling doves, take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. But the Jews then said to him, what sign can you show us for doing this? And Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, this temple has been under construction for 46 years, and you will raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the words that Jesus had spoken. Here ends the lesson. May God transform understanding into action. Amen. Jesus is a very good storyteller. Blink and you'll miss it this morning, but there's a bit of a story being told in Jesus' actions. There's a, an effort that Jesus is making to reshape how his followers, and in fact all of the Jewish people in that area at the time, saw their relationship to God. It's important to understand a little bit about the temple before we can understand how dramatic and how rash Jesus' actions seem to be. There were two temples in Jewish antiquity. The first temple was built and then destroyed. And in the destruction of the temple, the Jews were exiled to parts of the world they had never been before. The destruction of the temple signaled a moment in which the Jews essentially became slaves again. So when the Jews began to return to their homeland, there was a sense that, well, if we build a temple, if we essentially reassert our identity as Jews... We're creating a sense of greater stability. We're here to stay this time, and we really mean it. And so the temple, in addition to being a place in which you could connect with God, was also a symbol of your identity. This building, this place, was a place where Jews could be Jews. But if you're not familiar with those temple customs, it might be confusing to hear Jesus driving livestock out of the temple. Why were livestock there in the first place? It wasn't a farm, it wasn't a barn. Why were the livestock there? Well, the livestock were there because the law of Moses had decreed that there were certain sacrifices that you needed to perform. A couple weeks ago, you'll recall that Jesus heals a leper, and when Jesus healed that leper, there were certain things the leper was required to do, according to the law of Moses, in order to get his life back. For one thing, he had to go to the high priest and essentially file a claim. There was a lot of red tape and bureaucracy associated with his healing. And part of being certified healed of your leprosy was to perform a public ritual sacrifice of an animal with the help of the high priest who essentially would give you the rubber stamp of approval and say, yeah, in fact, you are healed. Well, that standard did not just apply to lepers. It also applied to those who had sinned. It also applied to those who were getting married or reaching other milestones in their life. 
the law of Moses as a moral code demanded or expected that animal sacrifices were essentially the currency of our relationship to God. Now, what's interesting to note about this is that even at the beginning, when these sacrifices were instituted, God makes it very clear that it's not the sacrifice itself that matters. It's the act of essentially giving something up to God. Taking something you own that's precious to you, like livestock, which was at times used as actual currency in bartering, but was also a source of your food and your, your agriculture, your sense of wealth, and giving it over to God as an act of sacrifice, a literal sacrifice in the sense that we're talking about animal sacrifice, but also a figurative sacrifice. You're giving up part of your wealth. Over time, particularly once the second temple was built, the system changed a little bit. And maybe this is something that you can recognize. The spirit of capitalism had taken hold just a little bit and made it easier for you to participate in temple sacrifices by essentially going to the temple, buying, presumably at a discounted rate, livestock directly from the priests, and then having those sacrificed on your behalf. It outsourced the problem of your sacrifice and had someone else deal with it. It was a really good idea when you think about it, because no one wants to get their hands messy, and people don't necessarily want to sacrifice animals they've become attached to, Plus, there's all that business of getting your animal from wherever you live, and many people made very long treks to the temple, into the temple space, signing off with the priest and going about your business of making the sacrifice. So instead, you just paid a pretty penny, and they provided you with everything you needed and took care of the business for you. The temple had become a source of commerce, and Jesus is incredibly uncomfortable with this connection. In Jesus' mind, the temple is a source of connection to God, not a source of connection to property, to value, to ownership. And so, at some point, he had had enough. Remember, he grew up in this culture. He knew this culture. This wasn't the first time he had seen these things. But in this point, he chooses to make a statement to, through his actions, tell a story. And the story is that it's not about our convenience it's about our relationship. It's not about what's easiest for us. It's not about using our faith to turn a profit or to gain something of value to us and us only. It's about sometimes making a sacrifice to God. It's ironic when you think about it because for so long, Christians have defined ourselves in contrast to Jews as, well, they were the ones under the old laws they were the ones who had to make the sacrifices, and now that Jesus has come, we don't have to do that. But here is an example of Jesus essentially defending the integrity of the old practice and saying that it had lost its way. Here's an instance of Jesus saying, no, the sacrifice thing is fine, but how you go about it matters. I don't want you to cheapen it. I want you to take it seriously. Blink and you'll miss it, and there's another thing happening today in this passage. Jesus says, I can tear this temple down, or you can tear this temple down, and I will rebuild it in three days. Later, at the end of that passage, it says, oh, the disciples, after Jesus died and was resurrected, remembered that he had said that, and went, oh yeah, that makes sense. Essentially, something clicked for them. They finally understood what he was saying. I like that explanation at the end because it so rarely happens in the Gospels. A lot of Jesus's sayings are left open to interpretation, even to contemporary readers today. It's rare for one of the Gospel writers, unless you're talking about the Gospel of Matthew, which is not what we're talking about this morning, to kind of break the fourth wall and talk directly to the reader and say, in case you missed it, something important is happening here and I just want to make sure you caught it. And that's essentially what John does in this passage. He says, hold up. When he says, I will destroy the temple and rebuild it again in three days, he's not just talking about the Jerusalem temple, which later was destroyed and has still not been rebuilt. Instead, he's talking about his body. Jesus is telling a new story. He's shifting the status quo a little bit and challenging how his followers 
and others at the time see their connection to God. In the same way that the temple sacrifice system, specifically the monetary system where you could buy everything you needed right there at the front gate, in the same way that that had trivialized or gotten in the way of one's connection to God and taking the practice seriously, so too, Jesus seems to be suggesting, can we get so attached to a particular space that we miss that we can encounter God anywhere? And so Jesus, by essentially using the language of the temple, is turning, like he always does, turning our expectations on their heads. He refers to his own body and blood as the temple. The intersection point in which our quest for God and God's willingness to talk to and communicate with us meet in this humble Jewish Palestinian carpenter. This poor guy who's walking around for at least three years, essentially with nothing but the clothes on his back, relying on the hospitality of friends or strangers and telling people that the kingdom of heaven isn't in the temple. It's within him and within you and within me. A shift is happening. Jesus is looking at the old stories and he's turning them upside down a little bit and telling a new story. How we encounter God and how we think we can encounter God matters for our faith. How we think God makes God's self accessible to us affects how we relate to God. If we think God can only be found in one place at one given time in one particular point in history, we miss God and God's presence, very real and very tangible in our lives on a daily basis. I've talked before about the fact that we, we serve a mundane God. Meaning that it's a God, we serve a God who shows up in the mundane, shows up in the ordinary, shows up in the plain. Not just in miracles, the parting of the Sea of Reeds, or resurrection, or walking on water, but a God who shows up in a smile. A God who shows up in someone who brings coffee to someone who's been busking on the corner for several hours, and it's cold, and I just need enough money to get a ticket to go to the shelter or whatever. A God who shows up in the ordinary, seemingly unsacred parts of our lives and says, hi there, I've been here the whole time. You just have to pick up on me. You just have to pay attention. When Jesus says we can tear down the temple and in three days rebuild it, what Jesus is essentially suggesting is that you don't have to go anywhere to find God. God is no longer there, God is here, and maybe also there. Wherever we find ourselves, God is already present, what we sometimes say, closer than a breath or a heartbeat. And sometimes we feel like we're not entitled to God. This is something I've, I've noticed a lot, and it's, I wouldn't say that I'm an egotistical person, maybe I am. Some people are laughing, so I guess it's true. But it's a really funny thing. I've never thought of, of myself as being, as being undeserving of connecting to God. I've never struggled with such a great sense of guilt that I felt like I didn't deserve to connect with God. But the more time I spend in ministry, the more people I find who frame their relationship to God in those terms. Well, you know, I'm such a screw-up. I make so many mistakes. I'm so flawed. If people really knew what I was like, if they knew what goes on in my head or in my heart, they would understand that I'm, I'm really not such a good person. It's all a very carefully maintained illusion. How can I possibly be a spiritual person? How can I possibly connect to God? Like I said, it's not something that I necessarily struggle with, but I hear it a lot. And when I read passages like this, what I see is Jesus essentially saying, you don't have to get yourself mentally or physically or spiritually into a sacred space like a temple. 
You don't have to clean yourself up and be perfect in every way or in mostly every way in order to find me or connect with me. Instead, where you are is perfectly sufficient. Where you are and where you find yourself is temple enough. When we do communion, I'm going to pull back the curtain a little bit, although I don't think it will surprise most people. We go to the grocery store and we get loaf bread. We go to the grocery store and we get juice, in this case not wine, because we don't, we don't use alcoholic communion blood. But we get ordinary things. I could potentially not pick up a loaf of bread and someone else would take it and go home and make a sandwich with the same bread that I use to consecrate for communion. Ordinary, plain things. The things themselves don't really matter. Where I get them doesn't really matter. I don't have to invest, and I learned this very quickly with this congregation, I don't have to go invest in communion wafers. In fact, those are not very popular at all. I see disgusted faces. No, they taste like cardboard. I don't have to get pre-consecrated anything. I don't have to buy it from a church supply shop. I can just go to the store. And it's what we do, the intentionality that we bring to the act of serving communion that makes it a sacred act. When we met in the, in the uh, chapel the other day for the Ash Wednesday service. There was a Pilates class happening in the floor right here. They needed the extra space, and they didn't want to make too much noise to distract us. So we closed the chapel door, and Pilates went on, and as soon as the service was over, we opened up the chapel door, and we could hear them exercising. And the coach kind of, you know, okay, so do this next, do this next. There's music playing. It's not what you would categorize as a sacred moment. For some, it might actually break the illusion, break the sense that something magical or mystical is happening. We're in the very presence of God, I say, and then I open the door and Pilates. <laughs> it breaks the spell. And yet I love moments like that because they remind us that God is so willing and ready to find us wherever we are and that we don't have to work ourselves up into a fury into a frenzy to find God, to find meaning and purpose and divine love that meets us wherever we are. When Jesus says, I'll tear down the temple and I'll rebuild it in three days, what he means is, you will find me anywhere. The temple veil will be torn in two, the place separating the Holy of Holies, which was the space that only the most pure of priests could go. Only the high priest could go there. And there were all of these rules and restrictions about the kind of person you had to be in order to qualify as a high priest or even enter the temple. There were certain physical abnormalities, certain things about your appearance in addition to your ethics that either included you or excluded you from the life of the temple. And then the veil tears. And in three days... A new kind of temple emerges, one that's not bound to particular spaces, but one that's with us wherever we go. It's our temple, the temple of our bodies and our minds and our hearts. You know, it's funny, having a guest minister come in is a nice thing because I don't have to prepare a sermon. But when I got the call, I think it was, it was either Friday night or Saturday morning that James wasn't going to be able to make it this week but would have to come next week, I was looking at the scripture and I thought, how serendipitous that on the day when we hold a congregational vote about our building, it's the same day that we read this scripture. Not to let it sway us in one particular way or another, but simply as a reminder you know, in all this talk about the building, we've asked the question, what happens to our church family if we choose to give up the building? And I've heard some say, I think rightfully so, well, we'll continue to be a church. But I've heard the others say, it's so hard, and it is, it's so hard to be church without a space. What do we do 
So when I look at passages like this, it reminds me that whatever we decide, in whatever direction we go, that truth that we will always be a church family is not just a pretty line to sell. It's not just a smooth talking kind of thing. Oh, we'll always be church family. It's, it's a beautiful thing. It chokes me up. But it's true. And stuff like this is a reminder of how true it is. That for 2,000 years, Jesus has been calling his church to remember that buildings are nice and it's good to have a space. But that isn't the making or the breaking of the congregation. And that when we look to find God, all we have to do is look in the mirror. Or look across at the person sitting next to us. Or the person whose hand we're holding or looking out and seeing your faces, wherever I see them, whether it's in this space for years to come or somewhere else, you are the church. You are the temple. You are a room full of temples. And God lives and exists and breathes in you and sustains you in a way that no one but God can. So whatever happens to us, I ask you this morning, I implore you, remember the temple. And remember, and never forget, that it is within you, just like the kingdom of heaven. Amen.